So, oh. So with that, the the fat in the abdomen pushes up on the diaphragm, which is located right below the chest plate. Okay. In that diaphragm, it causes that large muscle, which lies in the chest cavity, to impinge on the lungs and restrict the airflow, in turn reducing lung volume and leads to collapse of the airway in the lower lobes of the lungs, where more blood flow arise for oxygen than up in the upper lobes. So experts agree, if you are obese, you are at higher risk of blood clots from in the veins that travel to the blood. Well, what about everybody's heard of cytokines, right? Well, what about this cytokine storm? What happens? What is a cytokine? Well, obesity has been proven to cause a little bit of constant state of low-grade inflammation. It releases cytokines, which are proteins, that fight the inflammation. So keep they keep the body on guard, okay? Simmering just like little soldiers to fight a disease. They keep away and keep in check other systems and cells. So when they are chronologically released, the imbalance can occur and causes injury to the body. And think of it like a small wildfire. Uh, it's dangerous, but not burning the entire forest down. So when a patient has been diagnosed with COVID-19 and obesity, it can cause the body to create another cytokine wildfire. When a person who is obese and has COVID-19, the two little small cytokines become together and they lead into a raging fire of inflammation that damages the lungs, the vessels in the body. Now, while that's going on, your body is in chronic state of inflammation that leads to something called endothelial dysfunction. Instead of opening the blood vessels as they close and expand, it closes them down and restricts further decreasing oxygen to the tissue, now allowing the COVID-19 to invade the cells and begin damaging the cell even further. Now, in closing, the importance of supporting healthy habits during COVID-19 are my following suggestions. Um, establish daily schedule and incorporate healthy behaviors, set meal and snack times, plan and choose nutritious foods. Well, thanks to Janice and Tannis and Tiffany and Nikki and Tara and Karen. Appreciate that. Thank you so much for all the work you've done. Um, having those healthy foods and having those gardens are very important and getting adequate sleep. Now, set alarms for wake and bed and distress, unplug. Get away from the media, get away from everything, be grounded, and encourage self-empowerment to improve healthy and well-being and contact loved ones. Now, mind you, this isn't the first time a disease has crossed the ocean blue and tried to kill the Native American population. We are still here and still strong and still standing. Uh, COVID-19 has hurt our small communities, loved ones, families, jobs, finances, and our younger generations. The poverty and lack of access to healthy foods, health insurance and financial opportunities combined to render the obesity, uh, and that is remarkably high. Here at PVPN, the community members must travel 15 to 20 miles away for healthier food into a town that doesn't have a mass mandate that is turn risking our lives and language and culture and traditions for healthier food options. Thanks to these wonderful ladies, and the wonderful gentleman that has worked so hard to uh, create these great opportunities. Now we have the chance to stay here and grow and stop this obesity epidemic uh, and it, being exposed to the virus in other counties. With that, I close and I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Tiffany, you are doing a great job. Would you like to continue? Um, well, next we have um, Tara. Tara Mitchell is a lifestyle coach with Prairie Band a Diabetes Program. Okay, hi guys. Um, I'm a little nervous. Um, I was so nervous that last night I had a dream I was giving a presentation with no pants on. So <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, I have pants on today. <laughs> but I was extremely nervous. So. Um, yeah, I'm Tara Mitchell. I'm the lifestyle coach here. 
I'm a certified yoga instructor. I graduated from Haas School with my uh, bachelor's degree in Indigenous and American Studies. So I'm a big history nerd. So that's the um, that's the that's where we're gonna go today. We're gonna talk about some history, and so I'm gonna go ahead and screen share um, here, and let me know if you guys can see my slideshow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Is that okay? Is it full screen? We can still see uh, three of us on the side. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to be talking about um, the lifestyles um, compared to now. So I went back four generations. Um, so this is my, in this picture, this is my great great grandma. Her name is Kiyokamokwa. And um, that was my grandma's grandma. And I was fortunate enough to talk to my grandma and learn about her mom's grandma, who was Kickapoo. And so, and I was also able to interview Anita Evans and talk to her about her mom. Her name was, uh, or her mom, her grandma, her name was Florence Wamigo. And so this is their lifestyle in the 1930s and 1940s. And it, it made me realize that um, I am very lazy and I do not know what hard work is. So I'm um, very fortunate to have the technology and everything. So um, I did, so, so traditionally um, the, during this time, there was a lot of hunting and gathering. Um, there were fishing, um, gardening, everybody had gardens. That was where they got their food. So they knew where their food was coming from. Um, they went foraging. I know Anita said her grandma would, um, they'd go hunting for gooseberries. Um, her grandma would actually go and find medicine in the woods if she was sick. She would go and um, look for her medicine and that's how she would help herself. Of course, they were you know isolated on these reservations in these food deserts. So they, all, they really did have to depend on um, finding their own food and medicine back then. Um, tanning hides was a big thing. Um, chopping wood, they had to cook over a fireplace um, most of the time or a wood stove. And so they would constantly be chopping wood. As you can see in the background, there's a, a lot of wood around. Um, looks like she's making a meat rack for the meat that they just got. And um, my grandma said they made birch bark homes a lot. Um, I was told that they had to haul water um, from a well, which was could have been a mile away so a mile there, a mile back, hauling all that water, um, that, that, that was a lot of work. Um, they were constantly moving. So if you didn't move, you weren't gonna survive. So like me, I just sit at my desk all day and I can just go, go to the Lindy Spring thing and get some water, or I can just go order a food and go pick it up. Like I, 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 would, I never had to do any of these things. So I think this is really, really interesting and in how they lived a healthy lifestyle without even knowing that they were, you know, taking care of their bodies. I'm sure they knew, but they really had no choice too. And so everything was done by hand. So I know they hand washed their clothes, they made their own baskets, they built, you know, the birch bark homes. So they were very, very strong, my great grandmas. And so I just went through and figured out how many calories they were burning doing all of those things. So chopping wood for one hour, 300 to 350 to 500 calories. That is a lot of calories. And they probably had to do this every day, you know, in the winter or just oh, every day if they needed to cook. So tanning hide for 30 minutes, 150 calories. That's only 30 minutes. I know that's a multiple days to do that. That is, that is a lot of work. Um, so foraging for an hour, you can maybe consider that hiking these days, um, 350 to 500 calories gardening for an hour and that's stuff like pulling weeds and um, some maybe harvesting for a day or an hour. That's 200 to 400 calories. Hauling water from a mile away and back, 200 calories. And some if you're gonna include the um, holding the water using your muscles. And washing clothes by hand. I, I take it that's just your own clothes or your family's clothes, 300 calories just to wash your clothes. And then of course you had to hang them. So that, that's just a waiting game there. And then um, hunting by foot. 
um, 6,000 calories a day. So I, my father-in-law, he prepare, he goes hunting every winter and he goes to Montana and he prepares two months in advance. He gets ready, he goes, um, he works out and gets prepared to hunt because he's gone for maybe two weeks out there. And um, he uses a bow and so he'll get an elk and you have to be strong enough to carry that elk back and then strong enough to, you know, skin it and do all that stuff. So sometimes we're lucky and we get elk meat and moose meat sent to us from, and my kids love it. So that's great. Um, altogether, just those things I mentioned here, there, that was an average from like 1500 to 2000 calories, just doing those things. So I would say they were burning about four to 5,000 a day, just living their lives like that. And this was what my grandma and Anita remember eating um, growing up. Um, they had, of course, they had three sisters. Um, everyone had corn, beans, squash, potatoes, green beans, and onions in their gardens. Um, they ate deer, turtle, rabbit, squirrel, fish, and they all had chickens is what I was told. They, everybody had chickens and that's where they'd get their eggs. Um, berries, uh, gooseberries, strawberries, I think my grandma said choke cherries is what she used, they used to eat. Uh, nuts, that's like acorns, um, walnuts, whatever they could find. Roots, I'm not really sure what kind of roots they were eating. I'd have to look, uh, ask some more people about that. Uh, mushroom, mushroom season's coming up, guys. So um, if you want to get out and, you know, try to look for mushrooms, I recommend asking somebody who uh, can take you if you've never done it before. It's, it's really fun. It's like an adult Easter egg hunt, but it's really hard. <laughs> so I went last year. I, I didn't find any. So um, hopefully this year I'm, I'm lucky. And I'm wild greens. So um, recently my son and my uh, niece, they found wild onions in my grandma's yard. And so um, they weren't ready yet, but they, they, you could really smell them. So that was the first thing. I don't know how they know how to find those. I think someone taught them, but they, they found them. And so um, I just want to mention that um, it wasn't until 1939 to 1940 that the first documented case of diabetes um, was recorded in um, Native America communities, Native American communities. So if you look at this timeline of the lifestyle here I did, it was 1930s to 1940. So something had happened right after that, that caused diabetes. So I don't know, I'll have to do more research and see what happened after 1940. Um, what changed on our reservation to see who was the first person to be diagnosed and who, um, why, why it happened. And so, yeah, that's, that's one thing. Um, I do want to, in closing, I do want to share this book that we got, I'm gonna take my screen off real quick. Um, okay, um, I wanna share this book here. It's called Let's Eat Good. And these are all um, traditional foods for healthy living. And this was recommended to me by a friend of the Pokagon Potawatomi. Um, he works up there and I asked him for some recipes and this is what he recommended. So if you guys are interested in getting one of these books, just um, email me, my email is in the chat box there and we can get, get some sent to you or send us your information and we can um, get you one of these books. So um, that's all I have. And if there's any questions, feel free to ask me. Well, Tara, this is Deanne DeRoyen uh, speaking. And um, I just wanna say that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And it's curious to me because Earlier this morning, I was thinking about how we need to not just focus on, you know, the contemporary facts that we know about health and nutrition, but it's equally healthy for us to look at our culture mm -hmm. and be reminded of who we are and of where we came from, what we knew, what we can relearn. So that was just perfectly in line with what I was thinking earlier today. So thank you. Very All much. right, thank you. That's my that's my um, focus here as a lifestyle coach is bringing back some of those cultural 
um, practices and eating that we kind of kind of have lost. There's still some there, but maybe mm -hmm. a little more, a little more. Yeah. So we need what Matt can tell us, and we need what you can tell us, and what everybody else has to say today. So thank you. And I believe it's Agnes or Karen. Karen is with us. And Karen, were you going to share with us today? I am, thank you. Would you like to tell us a little about yourself? Hello, my name is Karen Mullinex. I have been a registered nurse for 40 years. I spent most of my time in the hospital setting. Um, since I have come here, I love it. This is a different environment than I've ever experienced before. And um, I can't say that I enjoy the focus on diabetes, but um, I have a passion to help people make better choices and to understand what some of the um, Americanized foods are doing to them and to their population. So, that's kind of where I come from. Um, first of all, a couple little tidbits. Um, the Topeka police report that the suicide rate is up by 140% in the first quarter of 2021. So that goes back to what is happening in our world right now and how it is impacting us physically and mentally. And secondly, um, the pedestrian vehicle deaths are up by 20%, although driving is down. And what we're finding is more people are walking and that more people are driving impaired than ever before. Um, again, stress. Um, we're also finding that the majority of the pedestrian deaths are amongst the elderly. Um, today, my talk is location, 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 and the real estate of our body and how it, how it tells its story. Did you know that fat intake or dietary fat is necessary for health? It affects many things, hormone regulation, regulation of hunger, blood clotting, tissue growth and healing, immunity, and lots of other little tidbit things. Fats are necessary to us. When we're born at full term, we have what is called brown fat stores. And that helps the baby maintain their temperature. And it also helps um, those first few days before the mother's milk comes in. They use that for energy. Um, when you're born prematurely, you don't have those fat stores. Um, we continue to have some brown fat throughout our lives. And it is noted that the people who live and work in the cool or cold environments, they have more. And that, um, yes, we can actually make brown fat and the people that live and work in those environments do continue to make brown fat throughout their lives. The other two types of fat are white and beige. And we all know what that white fat is. Well, now they have found uh, beige fat and it's where our body is attempting to convert that white fat into brown fat. So some of those people who have beige fat are um, working to reduce their fat stores and changing their diet. Um, we know that um, fat is made in our body, or excuse me, fat is stored in our body in three areas, in the form of triglycerides, sub-Q fat, and omentum fat. And sub-Q fat is what you're gonna find under your skin anywhere. Omentum fat is fat around our abdomen. When we take in too much fat in our diets, our body likes to store it for later use. You know, we're, we're saving ourselves for that future of starvation. The problem becomes 
where that that fat is stored. And that's where we get to the location, location, location. When we store fat in and around our abdomen, that includes the liver, the heart, the pancreas, as well as our kidneys. And so does anybody notice the areas I did not describe for fat stores? Our bottoms and our thighs. If you tend to store your fat there, you're better off than if you store your fat across your tummy. Um, we also know that these excess deposits like Matt described, especially those in the abdomen, they can produce inflammation in our body. And that inflammation can lead us to, it is a driving force behind a lot of our chronic diseases diabetes, heart disease, dementia, and also the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which we're seeing a huge increase in that with the diabetic. So um, types of, of dietary fats, I'm gonna call them the good, the bad, and the ugly. The goods are your poly and mono unsaturated. And those are the things that come in typically things grown from the earth. Nuts, avocados, fish, seeds, beans, olive oil, and other things along that line. The bad are saturated fats. Um, our fatty beef, um, fatty chicken, butter, any processed meats. And then the ugly are those trans fats which are actually a man-made fat. So think about that when you're reading those product labels. Oh dear, trans fat, that package goes right back on the shelf. The good thing we know about fats is that when we have weight loss, our bodies are smart enough to remove the unhealthy fats first. So what does that mean? Studies show that someone who experiences a 16% weight loss, so you think of someone weighing, weighing 200 pounds, losing 16% is 32 pounds. That equals a 65% reduction in their liver fat stores. One of the first places our body gets rid of our fat when we lose it is away from the liver. That's good news because that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease um, is as bad as diabetes. You put the two together and then we're really in trouble. The takeaway is healthy fats are necessary. It's okay to eat them. You need to have them every day. The other takeaway is that it's not necessary to achieve a normal weight. Even a 5% weight loss can give you improvement in your health risks. And I'm a little bit less than 10 minutes, but thank you everyone. And any questions or concerns, holler at us. That was good new information, thank you. Thank you. And now we have Tandy Thanks. Grendis. Karen, we'll, sure, we'll start with our part. Um, welcome to the Lunch and Learn today. And I have the uh, opportunity to introduce um, some members of our team that are working with the Tribal Food Systems Project. And we'll be presenting today a little bit more about um, National Nutrition Month is this month here. And um, it's a national, nationwide <clears throat> event. And our project works not only with encouraging healthy eating, as all of our speakers have been sharing, but physical activity um, resources as well. So I'd like to um, introduce our presenters will be Janice Simon, our project director, and then um, Becky Willman, our nutrition assistant, um, and Nikki Jack Jackson, one of our nutrition assistants. So uh, welcome and Becky, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Becky Wilman. I'm a registered member of the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. Um, and so just to talk to you a little bit about 
uh, National Nutrition Month. So we want to focus on what we're putting on our plates, um, eating a variety of nutritious food every day. We want to teach people uh, different tips and tricks on how to plan healthy meals for their family, maybe even learning a new skill to help improve your cooking, um, trying out healthier recipes. Um, so, I mean, this is, is nationwide. And so we want, we want to in, include everyone in this and, and we can help you do all that. Um, we are offering uh, free virtual classes now. We're hoping at some point, maybe mid to late summer that we could uh, once again, all meet in person. Um, and we'll, in those classes, we'll be talking about nutrition, about cooking, about what you can do to get some more physical activity in your day. Um, and also, you know, how to, how to plan your plate. Like this um, graphic here shows all the food groups and kind of what the portion size should be for your meal of fruits and vegetables and grains and protein and, and even a little bit of dairy. Um, and so, you know, we want your plate to look colorful. Um, and we want to talk about the difference between a portion and a serving. So a portion is, is what you are served, whether you're at a restaurant or whether you're at home, or if it's a prepackaged food that you're maybe snacking on. Um, and a serving is the measurement set by um, the government and is posted on the food labels of virtually everything that you buy now. Um, and they've changed those labels a little bit um, to be easier to read. So serving size and calories and some of the major uh, nutrition is now bolded so that you know you can just glance at that nutrition label and, and see the things that, that are really important as far as your nutrition and serving sizes are concerned. Um, serving sizes have changed or portion, I should say, portion sizes have, have changed so much. Um, but you know what, you really don't need any special equipment to, to figure out what your portion size should be. So everybody's fist, typically, not always, but typically is about a cup size. So you should have a cup of vegetables. Um, so you can make a fist and go, oh, so that's about what size I need to to make my vegetables. Um, if you look at your thumb, that's about an ounce of cheese. So, okay, so if I'm making scrambled eggs, that's about how much cheese I can, can add. Or, you know, a handful of nuts. Um, also, the inside of your palm should be about three ounces, four ounces, and that's the amount of, of meat that you're supposed to eat at any one sitting. Um, but even looking at, you know, portions from, you know, several years ago, back in 1954, you know, you got one patty on your hamburger, it was about two and a half or three ounces, and that was your portion. You know, today you have three patties on your hamburger and it's 12 ounces. It's nearly 1200 calories, which really is not far off from all the calories that you're supposed to have in a day. Um, and we've been talking that even, even our dinner plates, you know, when we, you know, go to Walmart or Target or wherever and, and buy our dishes, um, even the dinner plate sizes are bigger. Um, our dinner plates used to be the size of what we would consider a salad plate now. Um, but you know, our, our dinner plates are, you know, eight to 10 inches across. And so of course we have to fill them up. So we put more food on them. Um, you know, I think, I think portion control is out of control. That didn't make any sense. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Um, Thank you. this is Nikki Jackson. Um, uh, just following up with what she's talking about when it comes to drinks to the portion distortion, if you get your large cups of soda or whatever, really 400 calories, that big uh, drink compared to your 150 calories for probably a small, um, paying attention to that and making smart drink choices. Um, some of those um, 
drinks that you might have, soda. If you're gonna drink soda, then trying to drink it every once in a while, not very often in smaller portions. Uh, I know those little cans, like the real miniature, like small ones are like a hundred calories. Um, and I don't know what everybody thinks about diet pop or diet soda, but um, may or may not wanna drink that. Um, so other smart drink choices would be milk, low fat or fat free milk and the nutrients in the milk help with uh, bones, teeth, muscles and nerves. And then there's other types of dairy if you don't drink milk, look for eight ounces of fat free low fat yogurt or frozen yogurt or even uh, one and a half ounces of low fat cheese is your equivalent to the eight ounces of milk. And if you're like me and you don't really uh, try to consume dairy um, or eat yogurt or cheese, you might be lactose intolerant. I know that's kind of prevalent in native communities or you have allergies or you just don't like it. There's also ethical and religious reasons. There's other ways to get those nutrients from other foods. Um, you, if you wanna get the good sources of calcium, there's different options like your rice and soy milk, calcium fortified, calcium fortified orange juice, cereal, canned salmon or sardines with bones, almonds, broccoli, and then your green leafy vegetables like collards, kale and bok choy. And if anybody likes tofu, I eat tofu, but that's also a good source of calcium. And of course there's water. Choose water if you can. I know some people really don't care for drinking water constantly. I find that if you add ice, if you have ice water, it's easier to drink. Uh, it helps control your body temperature, carries nutrients, aids your breathing, protects organs and your joints. Um, I've also um, heard from a doctor that, you know, your muscles, when you have pain in your joints and your muscles, the water kind of acts as a lubricant and allows your muscles to kind of glide easier in your body. So it might reduce some of that um, discomfort. And if you also, if you was to use like the sweeteners, the add-ins, um, again, like Becky said, read the labels, you might get sugar or other things that are in there that you might not wanna consume. Thanks. Thank you. This is the, the flyer um, for the class that I will be teaching. Um, we're starting on Tuesday evenings at 5.30, uh, starting April 6th, and then through the next uh, six Tuesdays. Um, so there's information if you're interested in the class. Um, you can either text me or um, email me at my KSU uh, email address, um, and it'll be, it'll be fun. I'll teach you how to cook healthier. Please note on the flyer also that you need to register for the classes. We will try and cap them off at 10 attendees, but if we have a overflow, we will set up another class for that. And then we, you will receive a $25 gift card for attending the class and doing a pre-test and a post-test. And then we also provide a $10 gift card for you to buy the ingredients for the recipes for each week to cook along with Becky, if you're interested in that. And then also on top of the gift cards, you will receive um, incentive items throughout the classes, like measuring cups, measuring spoons, um, spray water bottles to wash your vegetables with, a uh, vegetable brush, chopping boards. We have a lot of cool stuff. And then we have also been working with the tribes in K-State on setting up garden workshops. First one will be April 28th from 5 to 6 p.m. This will be virtual. And that is for the Prairie Van Potawatomi Nation area. The second one will be May 6th from 6 to 7 also virtual and we have it 
it says here, Kikuku tribe, but we're also inviting Iowa and Sac and Fox tribal members also, our community members to that. And then on April 29th, K-State will have plants available. And then on April or on May 6th, they'll also have plants available to those communities. And I can help get those out too. Hi, Janice, you were saying May 6th, and it says May 5th on the flyer. Okay, May 6th is when the vegetables or the plants will be ready and distributed. But the, the Zoom session will be May 5th. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks for letting us share about the Tribal Food Systems Project and some of the things you might be able to learn in classes with us. Well, yes, and thank you all. Um, so let me do my welcome now that we're at the end. I'm sorry, I was having some Zoom issues. Um, so I'm Deanne, and along with Zach Kamami, Vice Chair of Prairie Band, we are the co-chairs of the Tribal Health Summit Planning Committee which is now in its at least ninth year. And we are the folks who do the annual Tribal Health Summit, normally at Prairie Band and the Conference Center. And last year, last August was the first time we did it virtually. And so the Tribal Health Summit Planning Committee, of which Tiffany Lewis is our new coordinator, and we are delighted to have her. She is scary. She is so organized and so efficient. It's wonderful to have her help. Um, and so we will begin the planning for the, for the summit in April at our next monthly meeting. Um, some things that I thought would be uh, good for you to know is that we hope that these lunch and learns uh, are helpful to you and, that, um, and your constituents. I think that those of us who are here today are sort of the ones who, who usually do the health education work. And what we need to figure out is how to expand um, into our communities to let people know that we're doing this. It may turn out that this is not the best time. And if there, or the other option is that uh, if we are able to get people's permission to record these sessions, then we can make them available whatever time is convenient for them. Although obviously the Q and A won't be possible. Um, a couple of other things I wanted to say. Um, oh, I know I did want to talk about the fact that the Food Systems Project, of which Tandy is the um, overseer primarily, uh, Janice is the director, and she has uh, the, the direct contact with the four tribes. All of the four tribes early on said yes, they wanted to be involved. And the overall purpose of the Food Systems Project is to look at where most of our communities are getting their food, you know, how much from the store, how much are they growing, fishing, hunting, foraging, et cetera. What can be done to increase the availability of healthy foods and the healthy preparations of those foods? And it was so wonderful to get a little bit of history about um, how that used to happen. And I also thought it was great when Becky was talking about, you know, no measuring cups and spoons because I'm thinking about my grandmother you know, grabbing a handful of flour and throwing it in the skillet when she was making gravy or whatever. And it's sort of like, we didn't used to have cups and measuring spoons. So, you know, there's a lot, a lot to be learned, but it's really wonderful that you're here with us today. Matt and, um, you know, Tara and, uh, you know, um, you know, Karen, I once, I think I may have told you this, I once knew someone from the California Indian Education Association whose name was Agnes Molinex. And so I always want to call you Agnes and I apologize for that. But we appreciate, uh, you know, everything that you had to say and likewise the, the crew from uh, the Food Systems Project, that was great. So if you have ideas for us about um, how you think we could do a better job of lunch and learn, uh, any aspect, timing, scheduling, whatever. Um, if you have questions, if you have suggestions for other topics, all of that we would love to hear. And I believe that Tiffany is going to show you uh, her contact information, which all of you probably have, but just in case, um, she is going to be the person who collects this information for us. Now, let me see, I've got a couple more minutes here and I wanna let you know that um, the Tribal Health Summit Planning Committee is in the process of becoming a not-for-profit organization. 
because there are other people such as K-State Extension, uh, you know, who would like to work with us, uh, but they can't because we don't have nonprofit status. And so in part of that, uh, one of the fun parts is deciding what our name should be. So we are currently looking for a good name for the tribal, for when the Tribal Health Summit Planning Committee becomes its own nonprofit. So if you have any ideas related to health, native culture, native history, nutrition, uh, the elements, uh, whatever uh, clever ideas you have, uh, send those to Tiffany too, and uh, let us know whether you would like to be anonymous or if it's okay if we say this name was, this great name was suggested by Janice, for example. So, so does anyone have any questions uh, or thoughts or comments they would like to share today? And if not, thank you all very much for helping us launch Lunch and Learn and for sticking with us. And we hope to see you uh, next month. And Tiffany, would you like to remind us what next month's uh, topic is? Yeah. Oh, Tiffany, you are on mute. Tiffany did have to leave for 15 minutes and it may be that she um, wasn't able to come back as soon as she thought she would. So let us just say you will be hearing from us. Uh, if there's any question about whether Tiffany has your email or not, um, if you're certain that she does, then you will definitely be on our list and we will be letting you know soon what the April topic is, uh, the precise date and time, et cetera. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rain that we're getting. Take care. <laughs>